I'm Miles Booth, and tonight we are interviewing Brian P. Easton, author of the Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter series. Brad, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Miles. How are you? I'm doing great, too. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming on and, and for starting this entire project that we're about to discuss. Uh, it's a, an amazing project to even think about uh, in scope, uh, and I cannot wait to see how this turns out. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm real excited about, uh, about the great group of people we've got on board so far and uh, excited to see what they're going to have uh, you know, to, to, to bring it to the table. And uh, yeah, I just can't wait. It makes two of us. So for our new listeners, uh, new viewers that don't know what we're talking about, Brian has opened up his series to guest authors to write a story. We're going to do an anthology and it's, uh, we're going to put the cover up uh, right now. This is the, the cover in progress. And uh, this is going to be stories written in his universe. He's allowing other authors to play in his sandbox for the first time, which is an amazing opportunity. Uh, and, and it brings up uh, the, the first question that I have. What inspired you to open up your universe that you've created to let other people come in and write stories about your, your creation? Well, I... I don't know if, it, if any one particular thing just woke me up in the middle of the night and inspired me, but I had always been, since probably the end of the third novel, The Lineage, uh, I had really been impressed by how big what I had created actually was. Uh, when I started out, of course, this was not the, in, the intent. Uh, you know, it was a series of short stories that I wrote, you know, back in you know, the, the, the early 80s, you know, and it was something that I had fun with and it kind of matured and evolved into the thing it is now. And that kind of world building that took place was a very gradual process. But when, like I said, but when, when the third book was finished and I kind of stepped back from it and I kind of went, holy crap, there's a lot here. You know, there's a lot, there's a way lot here, you know, way more than I can, than I can handle. If I wanted to try to do justice to it, I won't live long enough, you know, to really do justice to it. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool if other people were, first of all, interested, you know, in adding something to this universe? Uh, first of all, you know, I, I try not to be so arrogant as to think that anybody is just going to jump at the chance to, you know, to, to do that. Uh, but I thought, wouldn't it be cool if there, if, if there would be, you know, such people? And the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, I think there might be a few. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I reached out to those uh, that I knew and that I trusted, uh, you know, that I knew were good, good writers and uh, said, hey, I'm thinking about, you know, putting this together. Do you want to play in the sandbox? And uh, I, nobody said no, which, you know, just thrilled me and made me feel very good about, about the, the series and, uh, and uh, myself. So, uh, yeah, that was uh, that was kind of the main thing was just the scope of it and how much there is to tell or could be to tell. It's a huge it's a huge universe. It is a huge universe. When you first mentioned the idea to me, the ideas just started bouncing around the room and there's so much that can be done. Um, let me ask you this. When you started to to think about that, did you have thoughts of particular characters or storylines that maybe you never went into yourself, but that you'd like to see done? I kind of went into it with the idea that I wanted to be surprised. Okay. Uh, because I learned a long time ago, whether you're dealing with a writer or an artist or a musician, you'd never try to pigeonhole their creative process. Sure. You let them do their thing. Yep. And then you're going to get the best work out of people if you just let them do what they do best and not try to micromanage them or even necessarily even put any kind of ideas on them. Mm -hmm. you know? So more than anything, I was just interested to see where everybody was would be coming from, from their own personal point of view on their take on what I had written and how they would approach that. 
So, no, I don't think I really had anything that I really wanted to see explored uh, any more than I just wanted to see the different angles uh, that there were, the different perspectives that is, are unique to each of us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to go ahead and mention now that currently there are four books in this series, and we're working on the fifth right now, but the, the first four are Autobiography of the Werewolf Hunter, Heart of Scars, and the Lineage and uh, the, the Michael Witcher Fox journals. Um, and that's for our newer authors that are, are new to this idea, the authors, uh, that may want to submit something because we do have three spots open that we're going to make available for people to just send in a, a script and see what, uh, see what we have going on. So for anybody interested in that, you go to mbpress.com. Uh, and uh, you'll see the open calls uh, book on the website or the link on the website and follow the instructions, send in your ideas, and you may be chosen to be in the book. Um, getting back to your, your universe and what we were discussing, specifically in, in the lineage, and uh, I think after that one came out and I said, this is my favorite book by far, which is saying something. With, yeah. with your trilogy at that point, it was a trilogy. When you were coming up with the scope of it and all of the characters, when did you realize that it was really going past just Sly's journey and, and perspective in a, in a one human being's uh, experience and you had created an entire world? I mean, yeah. was this in, in Heart of Scars or was this in... Well, clearly you had to have the idea before you started writing the lineage, but I think what really spurred the idea that this was bigger than Sly, well, let me step back. It's always been bigger than Sly. Right. It was Michael Winterfox's game to begin with. Right. And it got passed down to him, but we're introduced to Sylvester as the first entry in this series. And we're introduced to his life and how he handles things. In the Winter Fox journals, of course, in the, the prequel that I'm uh, uh, series that I'm writing, uh, it's a whole different ball game, a whole different time. But I guess the, to answer your question, there is a, a scene in Heart of Scars where Sylvester is on the Isle of Man, and he is there. He's been trying to run down his leads on to try to find where the grounds of Saint Dismas. And this, just to make a long story short, this kind of is like part of the uh, one of the big plot points of the book. You right. know, where is where are the grounds of Saint Dismas? Uh, Saint Dismas being the patron saint of, of uh, prisoners and uh, other things. And there are schools and there are you know uh, parishes named after him all over the world. You know, not as many as there would be Saint Patrick or some of your some of your better known saints, but there are places. So. It ends up it's on the Isle of Man. And while uh, Sylvester is on the Isle of Man, he comes across the, the big bad for, for Heart of Scars, uh, Peter Stoob, who is a historical uh, werewolf. Uh, and I made him into my own version of himself for, the, for Heart of Scars. But when he meets him, he shows Sylvester a cemetery. And he says, in this cemetery are buried all the hunters who came before you. Ninety-nine, I believe. There were ninety-nine of them. That he had killed people who had come after him and that he had killed over the ages from like the 1500s. And, and he said something to the effect that you didn't really think you were the only one. And, you know, Sylvester's like, well, kind of actually I did, <laughs> to tell you the truth. And at that, that moment, I had to say, you know, I kind of did too. But when I thought about it, I'm like, it makes perfect sense. There is no way anything that is this powerful and this evil is a one-off, mm -hmm. you know, by anybody's estimation. So I thought, well, who are these other guys? Who are these other, you know, who are these other people? And then that begged the question, well, who are these other wolves, you know, uh, that are out there? And I had already kind of set up a world where there was already different factions. Uh, just within what we knew of the beast, uh, you had the Gandians, you know, who had this kind of not that wasn't really talked about too, uh, too much, but it was inferred that they had this dynasty that had been in effect since the Middle Ages or something. 
and that they were like the most powerful werewolf house in Europe, or were at one time, and today, who knows? Uh, and then there's, of course, Peter Stubbs' outfit, La Voisin. Uh, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's the uh, the, the Jabberwocky, right. you know, the, the the big criminal hiding in the shadows of other criminals. So, and that was run by different wolves. And then you had the Black Cross and the people who were in that, you know. So it's like the the, the, the scope of this thing was, was wide open. But I think that's when I really kind of got the the first kick in the pants to kind of start looking a little deeper into how big this world could be. It got big. Yeah. It, it got, it got real big. And uh, to my estimation, there are not many series that went into that number of characters and that amount of depth, certainly not in the werewolf uh, fiction, but I, an amazing read as it unfolds through the course of the book. Um, well, that's one of the, that's one of, you hit the nail on the head there. Nobody's done this with werewolves, to my knowledge, at, at all. And it kind of seemed too bad to me. And it always had. I mean, it's the whole reason Sylvester exists in the first place is because I looked around at the landscape, you know, of monster hunting and you know, uh, the vampire slayers that were big in the '70s and stuff. And I thought, well, where's the werewolf hunters at? You know, <laughs> where are those guys? I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to have to make one. So I, I kind of stepped up to do that. The monster hunter has existed for so long, and you you nailed that that persona in the first book, and then the second book elevated things to uh, to a, a place that I was not expecting. Uh, I'm going to kind of take a detour here real quick and and ask you what are your hard spy novel influences because it's something that not a lot of people talk about but the amount of research and the amount of, of puzzle pieces that you put together as far as just the the, the spy aspect of this is amazing it's, yeah you know i i don't know that i i'd like to tell you that i've read every book uh tom clancy ever wrote uh but i haven't right i don't even know if i've i mean i saw i saw the movies saw some of the movies you know uh, but I can't say that that really consciously influenced me at all. What influenced me more than anything was, uh, I guess, the secrecy that such things like this, you know, would require. Mm -hmm. I'm a deep believer in the deep state. You know, uh, I've at one time I could have been called a conspiracy theorist. I don't know that, that that's actually a thing anymore, <laughs> given what some of the things that we've seen. Uh, but. Uh, if we're talking about werewolves and monsters and supernatural creatures, I thought, you know, what the hell? Let's just let go for the whole thing, you know. So, uh, you know, and a lot of this stuff is, you know, is completely artistic license. You know, the yeah, of Orion ring and you know the, the, all that, uh, but that just kind of plays into my idea of what probably really goes on behind the scenes. Maybe not to that extent, of course, but the kind of mechanisms that are in place, gears within gears, almost like a, a Star Wars Imperial, you know, mindset uh, to, of control. Without question. Let me ask you this. Uh, did you ever read uh, any Robert Ludlum? Did you ever read Ian Fleming? Did you ever read, you know, any, anybody that, that's stuck in your head is like, wow, I really like how that element works. Because you went to painstaking lengths to, to make sure you were accurate. And uh, you got pretty deep into how these organizations conceptually would operate if this was a thing, if, if they were right. a werewolf, right. you know, bad guy. Yeah, I mean, I, I may have I may have read uh, an Ian Fleming novel once or twice in my life. I can't really put my finger on which ones that they were, but I'm not a huge spy guy. Uh, yeah. I mean, I watched. I guess watching the Born the Born Ultimatum and some of the Born series mm -hmm. is as close to it being really impressed by a spy movie uh, as I ever was. Except for, and I have to say this, Casino Royale, to a guy who never was interested in James Bond in his life, Daniel Craig hooked me on yep. with Casino Royale. Yeah, he took and it. I've been a, fan ever, been a fan ever since. Yep, definitely. Yeah, that that was a welcome change too. Um, <clears throat> I think for a lot of people. So it's interesting that you you didn't have a huge spy background, and yet you've integrated it so smoothly into the series. Um, 
And well, then, research does, you, you mentioned the amount of research that went into it. And, and you're right. I mean, I did do a lot of research. And I think research sometimes has the effect of uh, producing what you might expect to see if I had already read all those novels. Mm -hmm. See, I, I, I went into research and how does this work and how does that work? And I integrated it where if I had read those novels, maybe I wouldn't have needed to have done so much research. Uh, I don't know. No, I don't know because they're you're dealing specifically with with Canadian intelligence and you know, whatever whatever countries you're operating in, and then you've created a lot of your own organizations. So, so well, right, from and that's point of view. Yeah, you would have still done the research, but I think I, I was just wondering if you had inspirations or if you just said, "Wow, when I read this, you know, I thought it was really cool, and I wanted to put that into a werewolf world." One of the things that 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 I'm recalling is uh, when I was looking into some kind of an organization uh, was being impressed with the length and the breadth of the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. the British Commonwealth, and all the countries that fall into that club. And that's pretty much what it's considered, right? It's a big, it's a big club and they share their certain benefits and things. But I was like, there's no way an organization like the Commonwealth is going to exist without, without some kind of internal you know, regulation without some some kind of uh, internal or even you know external police force, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to protect it and uh, to keep the you know member nations in line along you know certain certain things, you know, uh, party line and, and whatnot. Um, and so the com that uh, the Commonwealth of Nations really was kind of a, a, a gateway to me uh, for Heart of Scars and all the things that that transpired. Uh, you know, government wise within it, because I started looking into it, like this thing runs all over the planet, you know, yeah. and uh, Canada is a part of that, you know, and so are a lot of the other cool countries, <laughs> Australia, New Zealand, you know, and uh, so I think uh, it took it global and did it so seamlessly was also a big, big win in my book. I mean, once you, uh, it's hard, number one, to just integrate supernatural into reality because, you know, the suspension of disbelief thing gets, gets tough. Um, right. but once you figure out how to do that and then you take it out of the environment that you perfected it in, that, that gets tough too. And man, you just ran with it. Thank you. No, absolutely. And I think even more. I think you see a lot, a lot more of that globe trotting uh, in the lineage. Uh, there goes it goes. It goes all over the world. Yeah, you know, no, that, I mean, literally. There's, there's, yeah, more, more globe trotting there uh, than than in the other books. Um, although you know, it builds from book to book, and each book has different countries and different locales that are featured, which I it, thoroughly enjoyed doing, by the way. Every time yeah. I had to go to a new country, I was like a kid, you know, I was like, oh, what are we going to find out about this? It's going to be nice and juicy for the story, you know. Yeah. Uh, even the little islands, you know, like Malta, you know, right. and uh, it's its whole history. And uh, yeah, it was just a lot of fun, especially going into the Himalaya to... Oh, man, and you, you pull it off really, really amazingly well. I mean, to the degree that, you know, I'm not going to ask you to give away your secrets, but there's several of those those passages where you're like, did he actually go there? <laughs> Just to be able to nail down, like, the scenery and the and the vibe of the place. Um, and it's, it's just, it's, it makes it a great read, which is the purpose, of course. So that, oh, that was that. definitely accomplished. Let me jump jump again so uh we did the three books uh where sylvester's the main character and now you are doing the the winter fox books and the first one has been out for a little while the winter fox journals and the second one you're currently writing right um is that do you have a trilogy planned for that or is that going to be something longer or you know i really don't know uh, right now, the way it's set up, the way that it's progressing right now, it could be a trilogy. Uh, it could also go six, seven books. I was wondering. Yeah, just not sure how I want to. Not sure. I'm not there yet okay. as, as far as how I want to want to go with it. I'll know more once I'm finished with the second uh, 
uh, installation of uh, Winter Fox. Uh, right now, I just I just broke ground on Chapter Five last week, and uh, we're I mean it, we're we're dead in the middle of World War One in Belgium. That'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean we're in Flanders. We're in mud up to our hips, you know. Uh, and Michael is just it's not what he thought it was going to be, you know. Coming from a background of a you know. Hiding the hiding the forest right into battle, you know, with a war with you know war cry and use the, you're in mud, you're in trenches. The enemy very seldom presents himself, you know. It's not uh, it's not something that he that he expected at all. And of course, how, how could it be? Uh, not just the way that things uh, worked out fighting wise, but the entire scope of the thing is be way beyond anything he's ever experienced. I even there's even a part in the book where he's on the boat. Sailing to England uh, with the uh, with his with his unit, and he just can't get over how big this boat is. He's never seen anything like it. He didn't know men could build boats this big. And they thought, and then he says, you know, if I thought the boat was big, the water, the water goes on forever. You know, he'd always heard about oceans, but he'd never seen one before. And this is just kind of setting him up for you know for what's coming. But he is a warrior at the heart of him. You know, he's a young man of 17, of course, who lies about his age, much as Sylvester did uh, mm -hmm. to get into uh, the uh, the U.S. Armed Forces. But he lies about his age to get into the Canadian Armed Forces. He, he crosses the border from the United States into Canada, and Sylvester does the other way around when he enlists. Yeah. He goes from Canada into the United States. Because neither other those countries were fighting that particular war at that particular time. Uh, so... Yeah, he's uh, he's right in the middle of it all, and of course, he's only there to hunt for werewolves, for a, a specific werewolf. Right. Uh, and this is all just kind of um, background noise for him. Okay. It's all camouflage for him. All right. How better to make a move on your enemy than go as a part of a unit where they can't, don't know who you are. They don't see you coming because you're, you know, you're. Uh, they're right there among the rest of them. And uh, it, it's getting pretty intense. In fact, I was writing, uh, like I said, I just started chapter five and I was writing on it on Friday. And I sat back from the page and I thought, you know what would be really cool? And I thought about it for a minute and then I thought, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. because It would, would be really cool, so I'm going to do it. It threw my whole idea off course. But that's the way the best parts come. Yeah, I was going to say that. Your ideas go right out the window and something new and better and fresher comes along. And uh, so, yeah, the next few, next few my next few writing sessions are going to be involved uh, with this incident uh, where Michael is in, um, he's on leave. He finally gets like a five-day leave after being in the mud for however many months. And, uh, of course, he takes uses it to his advantage to pursue his other war. Right. And uh, being in the part of the world he's in, he doesn't have to look very far. You know, we're, we're talking about, you know, an area right next door to the werewolf capital of the world, which was France. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, there are more werewolf trials and, you know, uh, werewolf, hist you know, werewolf historical type figures that come from that area of the world than I think there are any, pretty much anywhere else. At least that is commonly known. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I'm having a lot of fun just using old folklore and historical document documented trials and things and bringing that to bear all with you know being perceived through the mind of this 17 year old northern cheyenne boy who is abroad for the first time in his life with nothing but a sense of duty and his skills you know and uh so he's so much different than sylvester it just it just every day that i write him he just gets a little gets a little bit more different which yeah, is important first, the first book was very different Sylvester, in hindsight, after reading a little bit about Michael, you don't really you don't really understand how broken Sylvester is until you read about Michael and what he was supposed what Sylvester was supposed to be. Okay, and uh, you realize how broken that the guy really is. But yeah, I'm having a lot of fun writing it. Uh, I haven't had this much fun writing a writing a book since the last Winter Fox. <laughs> doesn't have the, the readers excited. I don't know. I don't know what would. I'm, <laughs> I'm completely intrigued now. I'm ready, <laughs> ready to read. Um, yeah. 
but it'll be a little while. So, well, my motivation is to not screw it up. Every time I think I get a really good idea, I get really nervous. Okay. So now I've got to execute this and not mess it up. It's pretty because nice. I'm not going to know what other people think about it until it's already out on market. You know, it's got to, I've got to be satisfied with it before it leaves, you know, leaves me to go to the editor or to the publisher. If it doesn't pass, you know, my, if it doesn't excite me, I don't expect anybody else to get excited about it either. So at this uh, point, I think a lot of people trust you. So <laughs> we're, we're looking forward to seeing what you, uh, what you have going on. <laughs> I don't, I don't think that, uh, I don't think anyone doubts your abilities at this point. <laughs> um, that's coming, and that's uh, that's a lot. Let's let's talk a little bit more about um, kind of the parameters of the anthology and what uh, what directions authors might take that in. So they have a range of times that they can operate within. And are there any any times that uh, you had mentioned the 99 hunters that came before Sly? And certainly um, there's there's modern era versus the 80s and 90s. Are there any is there any time off limits or or time periods that you would say you would rather see material written in? No, no, not not at all. Not as long as that in some way or some form it can tie in uh, to the to the universe. Okay, and I, right. I don't think that I don't think that's a hard bar to clear, uh, yep. given as much as much uh, the scope, you know, the the width and breadth of the of the universe is pretty pretty big. So I don't think you have a problem doing that. In fact, one of our writers I think is planning on, uh, and I won't say who or what, but I, one of our writers I believe is planning on writing something that kind of spans the dawn of from the dawn of creation. Wow. And kind of looks through the you know through the the evolution of mankind. And keep with one eye on the beast, and and, and how it progresses as well. So uh, I'm really looking forward to reading that as well as I am all of them. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Yeah, it. no, no, I have I have no no time periods uh, that I've got you know outlawed or blocked off or anything. Uh, in fact, I I welcome different you know, you know times, different places, different parts of the world. I mean, it's a, like I said, it's a global thing, and it's a thing that's been around since the Stone Age. So, you know, you can, you can, you know, do a lot, do a lot with it as long as it ties in, you know, and not necessarily, you know, with, by, by a thread, you know, by some obscure back, you know, but where, where, you know, any reasonable person could read and go, okay, yeah, this is, I see where this is coming from. Absolutely. It's got to be part of the world without question. All right. And out of the entire um, cast of characters that you've created, there are only three that are off limits. If I'm, if I'm if right, I'm yeah, uh, Sylvester, Michael, and Jericho. Right, yeah, Sylvester, Michael, and Jericho. Okay. Um, now, I, I may have, and, and Jericho is off is off limits for everybody. I may have uh, allowed done a dispens allowed a dispensation for Jericho with one of our one of our authors after talking with him and kind of seeing where, where, where uh, they were coming from. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm okay to sign off on this, on the person writing what he's planning on writing okay. uh, because it doesn't really, uh, uh, Jericho is a big mystery, which is one of the reasons, is the reason that I, that I don't really want people writing about him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a mysterious guy. His ends are unclear. And you know what exactly he is or represents is a little unclear, and uh, that's that's deliberate. Uh, it was deliberate from the first time that I introduced him as uh, as a bounty hunter. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, he's off limits. Uh, Sylvester's off limits, of course, for obvious reasons, and also Michael, uh, also for obvious reasons. But you know, uh, Dan Roger. Tanya Clemens, uh, you know, there's a lot of different characters in there that you could choose that you could choose from. You know, even you know, werewolf hunters. You've got Josefet Barano from the Soviet Union, uh, who was with Sylvester in in, in uh, 
in the Siberia when he came up against the Darkest Wolva. You know, his his story would be would be great to read. That would be very cool. There's a Graf Rudolph, you know, who has spent his life in pursuit of uh, Peter Stube because it was one of his ancestors that signed his uh, death warrant, and yet he didn't die. Right. So he's and so so he's like this knight of the Orthodox Church, and he is uh, you know got this holy commission to do, you know. So he, even he's not off limits. There's lots of lots of things you could do, and it even doesn't even have to be a character. You know that that shows up. You be your own character as long as it fits in somehow and pieces together with the universe. Very cool. All right. So there's a lot of latitude there, and what people need to do is uh, for the writers that want to submit something by February 15th of 2021, they need to submit the outline of their idea, and then they'll have until next fall basically to to turn in a final. Uh, a final story and then we're going to publish it after that so yeah. october 31st is the is what we're looking at right exactly exactly halloween 2021 perfect time that is a perfect time so that's when we're gonna have the book in hand and uh that's that's gonna be something to look forward to uh, very very cool let's uh let's move into another aspect of things that we've talked about a little bit uh before and that's how to translate this written work into uh, into film, into video. And it's something that not a lot of people go into, but in our world today, it seems to happen more and more often. And with the streaming services, we have more and more people looking for content. And uh, this is some amazing content. I mean, I, I would love to see this turned into a long-form TV series or a major movie film. Um, I guess you've been approached over the years by different people sending out uh, the the feelers to see if maybe something could work out. And um, you know, you're no stranger to that kind of of process. But um, the game has changed so much, especially with the pandemic now. Yeah. So moving forward. Would you rather see your material in long form TV or in major motion picture form? Oh, definitely. I'd like to see it as a cable TV series. Okay. Uh, picked up by just any of the, uh, any of the, I mean, from HBO to Internet Movie Database is now doing their own, uh, yeah. their own original series. Oh, you no, know, everybody's in the game now. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's getting, everybody's getting on board with it. And yeah. I, 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 I for years, I dreamed of a major motion picture, you know, and I still wouldn't kick that out of bed. You know? sure. Okay. Yeah. But to really, I think to really do the story justice and they do such amazing jobs with the, with, with, with their work these days. Really? It's like we, we've hit a new gold standard uh, when it comes to, to, to these kind of TV series. Excellent stuff. I mean, not everything, of course, but you know, the ones we're talking about. Yeah. And I don't think that, that there's any way to really, be inclus- all inclusive and to really do justice to the material than to have it as a series uh, that, you know, that goes from uh, episode to episode and season to season. Yeah. You know, I think, I think you could easily do a couple of seasons out of one book uh, and, and, you know, maybe even more depending on if you wanted to, if you, how you wanted to stretch it, you know, but yeah, that would be my, that would be my preference if I had to, if you put two contracts in front of me today, I'm going to pick the one with uh, with AMC or uh, uh, Stars or whatever, <laughs> rather than Paramount or MGM. I gotta, I gotta agree with you there, um, because having ten hours or twelve hours or thirteen hours to to tell a story uh, versus two hours <laughs> told a couple of times, two and a half hours, it, it's hands down. You get so much more quality, so much more story. So much more justice done to the original work. Um, and it's kind of and the other thing too is when it comes to ma- major movies, um, you know, they're especially with something like this, they're so heavily focused on uh computer graphics yeah. and uh, you know, CG, CGI animation and stuff. And I don't want to see that. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if I if my if it ever comes to light, I would rather it be a low budget with quality acting and quality storytelling. You know, with some even perceived effects, 
uh, and practical effects over some big explosion in your face. You know, there's a time and place for that, of course, but uh, I don't want it to, I, I wouldn't want it to turn out, turn into something, uh, something gaudy and, uh, you know, something that panders to the, the lowest common denominator of the, uh, the male movie, <laughs> movie goer. Uh, like myself, so uh, yeah, I definitely would want to would want to see some attention to uh, the dialogue, to mood, uh, to lighting, uh, even to color. I mean, if I could have my way, we'd dial the color down on this baby to about twenty five percent, just enough where you know there's color, and let it and, and go with that because that to me creates a mood uh, yeah, exactly. that you can't you, you can't come up with any other way. Yeah, agreed on that as well. That would be that would be amazing. Um, do you have any any particular series that you would say, wow, that got the closest to how I would like to see this turned out, or any directors or anybody? I don't really have any directors in mind. Um, at one time, I, I might have said Rob Zombie, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that time is I think that time has come and gone. Yeah. Um, yeah, directors. I can't say. I can. I can tell you the, the the some of the series that I've really enjoyed, and there's been a lot of them. Uh, and uh, Deadwood, for for one, mm -hmm. the Deadwood series pretty much. Well, there were the Sopranos first, of course. That's the the the, the Godfather of all these of all these series, right? No pun intended. But uh, and then then you had a, you know, they just kind of kept coming. Deadwood was one I probably watched that entire series six or seven times. Uh, you know, swearing and all. You know, it's just it's just good storytelling. Uh, and I've enjoyed The Walking Dead. I have enjoyed uh, Boardwalk Empire and Rome. And uh, you know, I, I was I, I watched Game of Thrones like everybody else. And um, you know, there's just been so many uh, so many good ones that I my confidence in the industry is way up here. You yep. know. <laughs> because of those, because of those series and the movies, unless it's being done by uh, by Disney or uh, Marvel, uh, it's probably more like down here. <laughs> oh, that's 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 a topic. Maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll drift to that in a minute. Um, you had mentioned Rob Zombie's Rob Zombie's day seems to have peaked and maybe maybe descended a little bit now. Um, what about casting? For, for characters because I that's that's kind of the same same boat these days like you can't you can't rely right. on the, the the faces from from the 80s or even you know the 90s or 2000 anymore you got any right. ideas of, of who would play who these days yeah uh, I've really tried hard to, to bring that into the 21st century you know when when the when the, the first first time I, I, I ever thought who would I get to play Sylvester you know, in the in the, in the movies, there was no question in my mind. Mel Gibson, a la Lethal Weapon. Yeah. You know, slightly un the slightly or very unhinged, I guess. Uh, you know, warrior with this uh, kill record and personal problems haunting them. I'm like, that's my guy. Yeah. You know, fuzzy mullet and all. You know that <laughs> that would be him. But of course, time moves on, and we said, you know, things things mature, they evolve, and. Uh, well, I really had a hard time coming up with somebody, you know, Daniel Day Lewis. And again, this is not current because Daniel Day Lewis has retired. And even now he's a bit too old uh, to take it up. But uh, I always thought his, if you could take his uh, performance as Bill the Butcher from Gangs of New York and Nathaniel Bumpo from Last of the Mohicans and put them both together, you would have just about Sylvester Logan James. Okay. And, uh, but like I said, he's, He's he's gone to the, the the people that I that I think of now uh, for for Sylvester. Um, I think a guy Pierce. Some of the some of his performances in things like the Proposition and and uh, at the end of uh, the Road uh, were uh, and I don't know if you saw either one of those, but he he plays he plays a very convincing. Uh, Sinewy, hard ass, I guess, and slightly grimy, you know, because uh, we're not talking about, 
you know, when we're talking about Sylvester, we're not talking about, you know, your knight in shining armor. No. We're talking about a guy that's going to get down and dirty because he's dealing with something more evil than, he, than most people can, you know, uh, can, can conceive. Uh, so a car- an actor's got to be able to pull that off. He's got to be able to be able to project that kind of borderline, you know, sociopathy, uh, but still be have you know a big enough heart and still have the audience rooting for him mm-hmm. and that's that's a fine line to walk you know when, I, when i'm writing and you know and i am quite aware that i have lost some people along the way where i, I just went too far for them and they could no longer root for sylvester and i'm like well you know that's i understand that you know? uh, so i think that, yeah. that that's another balancing act that would have to be done uh, if it ever went to a motion picture or to a, a series like you said um uh, Leave Schreiber was another one that I had thought about, uh, although he seems to be more suited to a werewolf. Uh, would he would look better as a werewolf. He well, played Sabretooth, you know, in the uh, in one of the X Men movies, you know. So yeah, he would be a good werewolf. Uh, and he'd be a good Sylvester too. He's not quite as raw and sinewy as as, uh, as a like a young Clint Eastwood, as I kind of always pictured Sylvester's uh, body type being. Uh, like you know, any which way you can, every which way but loose. Yeah. Uh, his Milo Beto days, you know. That's that's the or a, or a young young Scott Glenn from Urban Cowboy. Okay. Uh, Scott Glenn is a hell of an actor, and he's just a hell of a persona. And uh, when he was younger, he could have nailed it. I wouldn't have even called anybody else if he would have, if he was if he would have said yes uh, back in the day. And so there's uh, anybody right now. Like just say that that mid twenties to mid thirties age range that that you find impressive. That the you know, I'm not off. In, yeah, I'm not as up on those actors as I maybe I'm not maybe either. I, so I don't know. Yeah, and it's been a year since I've been to the movies. You know, so good God, <laughs> you know, they've not even been putting anything out to speak of. You know, or at least around here. Uh, I look forward to those days be being precedented again. Here, here, yeah. Back to the back to the movies. No. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I don't know. Uh, Guy Pierce is about the most recent I can come up with as far as uh, somebody that I could really see. And I'll tell you something else. Uh, acting and actors aside, I would just about I would just about as much like to see an animated version of the series as I would uh, an actual, you know, live action series. Yeah. Okay. If the animation is done, done well enough, gritty enough, you know, I think that would be incredible to see. Yeah. We, we've kind of talked about that before. Um, and you had, you had mentioned the episode of uh, uh, love, death and robots. And right. What's the, uh, I forget the title. Yeah, I do. I do too, but it's, it has, it's, it's the end of world war two. They've got the, uh, the Russian uh, or the, the the Soviet special forces on some kind of a of a secret mission of, in Siberia, and there's and they've got all these ghouls that have been plaguing the countryside. You know, you could choose your monster there, but in the in the in the the feature, it was ghouls. Yeah. And, uh, the artist and the director on that did such a fantastic job. I watched it two or three times, just imagining those as werewolves. You know, it's very easy with that setting and those those soldiers and that whole that whole setup. Yeah. Absolutely, you can see that. Yeah, I mean, because that that appeals to me, and I think that shows in my books uh, the blending with either Western or military or spy with the occult, yes. with with horror. You know, yeah. uh, by themselves they are what they are, and they stand alone. But you mix them together, you've got something that's not really been before, or at least not very much. Not much at all, right? So, it, you know, with with Winter Fox and the and that series, I've got the chance to kind of do that, you know, from a Western point of view, mm-hmm. at least more Western than uh, than uh, than before. I mean, it's early nineteenth or early twentieth century, so it's pretty much same old, uh, same as uh, same as. I mean, World War One is basically the uh, you know uh, the the Civil War with a few tanks and some bombs. You know, it's. Uh, not that much has changed warfare wise. Right. Uh, so yeah, I like I like the twisting of those of those uh, of those genres and that that episode of Love and uh, Love Death and Robots uh just 
nailed it as far as I was concerned. So I would love, to, yeah, I, I would love to see some kind of animation like that. That would be that would be very very cool to watch. I, I would be down with that as well. Let's take this in a little bit different direction than what we've been talking about. And you had mentioned the the Disney Marvel kind of thing that's going on out there. So I'm going to ask you just cold and on the spot. How would you fix the Universal Monsters right now? Hmm. <laughs> and I, I, I have an, that takes I have an answer for that. I bet you I have an answer for that. First of all, I would not try to reboot them into the modern age. Right. Would not try to do that. Your monster fans, your Universal Monster fans, by and large, and there's a lot of them, do not want to see the Frankenstein monster in the 21st century. Right. And what that would look like. They don't want to see the creature from the Black Lagoon in the 21st century. I and this is my opinion. I think this because this is what I would want to see. You know, uh, if we do a creature from the Black Lagoon reboot, I want you to start it off back in the 1500s in the Everglades with a bunch of conquistadors walking through the marsh, and one of them getting killed by a gill man. Them you know, fighting it out, or maybe not the Everglades, but wherever it was that they found the fossil in the, in the original, you know, and you show that body descending down into the mud with the hand sticking up, and then you flash forward, you know, a couple of two, three hundred years, and then, there you've got the iconic creature claw sticking yeah. up from the mud, and then you go from there, and you don't necessarily do a retread of it, but you keep it a period piece. Mm -hmm. Creature from the Black Lagoon was filmed in the 1950s. So keep it in the 1950s. You keep it 2020s version of the 1950s, okay. which is going to be different than the actual 1950s. You can't help it. It's going to be different because our perspective is different. Absolutely. Uh, and the same thing with all of them. You know, it's amazing to me how many Universal Monster fans disrespected 2010's Wolfman until The Mummy came out. With Tom Cruise, yeah. All of a sudden, everybody loved it. Everybody, everybody had nothing but good things to say about the Wolfman, and I like the Wolf. I like the 2010s Wolfman uh, from the get go. I mean, I didn't like everything about it, of course, but I thought it was good. It was mostly said good because it was serious. It yep. didn't laugh at itself, and it was a period piece. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing, you know. Films like Van Helsing uh, think they try to make it make the Universal monster some kind of a humorous jaunt uh, i mean you've got to be in my opinion you've got to go pretty dark before you need some comic relief yeah. yeah and maybe that's just me uh some people need to get a breath of air you know quicker than than, than other people uh but for me uh comic relief is fine and the, and the universal films certainly had no shortage of the comic relief you know uh but to make it a running joke uh, to make it some kind of a you know constant tongue in cheek film, you don't don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, take your monsters seriously. Let them take themselves seriously. Keep it period. And of course, you know, get yourself a good director, writer, and actor. You know, that's about as that's about as best of, of advice as I can think of uh, for uh, for that. Gotcha. All right. Well, fair warning. We're going to do interviews with uh, with other authors that are contributing to this anthology. I'm going to, I think, stick with that question as kind of a connection between all of the interviews um, and just see what people come up with. Because I think that everything that I'm hearing about the universal monsters and the dark universe and whatever else they have now, the dark army, I just, they keep getting further and further and further away from anything that I feel like is going to work. And I just don't understand how you can mess up perfection so bad. <laughs> It's and there is a good deal. There are a good deal of Universal Monster fans who don't want to see remakes at all. You don't have to have remakes. They are not. They're not interested in that. Leave the originals alone. And I understand that from a certain, you know, from a certain point of view. But it's not like the old ones are going to go away if they make the new ones. You know, if you don't want to watch the new ones, you don't have to watch the new ones. Stick with the black and whites, and that's fine. Uh, and I, you know, I understand it. But uh, yeah. But that's something to contend with when you've got a when most of your Universal Monster fans are over the age of fifty, you know, and uh, and sure you've got new you know new people coming on board with it and, and and stuff like that. But I think that makes up a minority of the uh, of that de particular demographic. Definitely. Well, I think that today's younger audience too. They're they're used to a completely different level of technology and presentation, and they're used to watching a 
phone and being able to dial up any number of streaming services and so forth and so on. So um, I don't even know where you go to find the Universal Monsters right now. Uh, and and I, I, I don't know as far as streaming. Uh, I know that uh, there's no shortage of, uh, of of DVDs on them. It seems like you know every year they release somebody releases a new a brand new collector edition set of DVDs. What was the last time you bought a DVD? <laughs> Yesterday. Really? Okay. I yeah. I I am pretty much old school. I like my DVDs. Okay. I right. really do. Yeah. In fact, I bought a pink Cadillac with Clint Eastwood. All right. uh, as the bounty hunter with Bernadette Peters. Uh, that's the one I bought. <laughs> hey, all right. Fair enough. <laughs> Taking us back there. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, and the other thing, too, with, with the monsters uh, and the dark universe, I can see where Universal could make the mistake the first time because everybody's trying to emulate the MCU, you right. know, and try to make this do what they did, you know. And they were going to do the same thing. They were going to try the same thing, you know, with the, the Dracula Untold and then uh, Tom Cruise's The Mummy. And nobody liked it. Nobody nobody wanted to see that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So you'd think that they would have learned from that. From Because, I mean, that's the other thing. Universal Monster fans are not quiet about their opinions. Nope. You know, they will gladly tell you all day long what they think about, about things. Uh, so to come back and try to do that again, it just really seems like nobody learned anything the first time around. They didn't. Did you see uh, The Invisible Man, the recent one? I did, yeah. What did you think yeah, of that? And as far as a moody, uh, psycho kind of a, of a picture, I really enjoyed it. I would not count it as Universal Monster canon. Uh, right. I would not consider it a, a, a good reboot for the H.G. Wells' right. you know, Invisible Man. I thought it stood alone for what it was. But if, if that's going to be your 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 uh, you know your archetype for your new universe, no thanks. Yeah, yeah I don't. I mean, I'll probably go watch it, but I'm not going to get on board with the whole. Yeah, no, but you got to call it a swing and a miss. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it was it was a fair movie. I think. I mean, it wasn't bad, um, but it it wasn't compelling, and it certainly didn't set up um, any characters that I found compelling. So yeah, it's pretty forgettable. I mean. Absolutely. I don't remember the actress's name. She did a hell of a job as being a frightened. She did a great uh, job. Oh, that's uh, uh, she was but, in the uh, and I forget her name too. Uh, but regardless, it's not a yeah. character that I that I was invested in. That I can't wait to see what she's doing today. Right. Absolutely. She had her experience. She went through it all, and you know, hopefully, she kept all the money. And now, you know, whatever whatever's going on with that. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we were supposed to anticipate seeing her as the invisible woman next. Right. I think that was the you think that was the the, the, the intended point. Isn't that what's planned? I don't I don't know, but that's what, what when I watched it and saw it to the end, I thought, you know, yeah, she's got she's there, she's got the suit, you know, now we're gonna go with an invisible woman. And yeah. uh, that would kind yeah. of I had to look it up. I think that there is going to be an invisible woman. I don't know that it, if it's going to use that character or, or her. Um, and I know that I, there was something I saw the other day talking about uh, a new Wolfman movie with Ryan Gosling. Ryan Gosling, yeah. And well, I mean, ra, ra, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to diss anything before I have a chance to see it. But uh, Ryan Gosling does done some pretty amazing work. He I does. Mean, some of it's really offbeat. But uh, it's been like, like uh, what was it, Baby Driver? Or no, just Driver or Drive. Driver. But no, it was Drive, yeah. You drive, yeah. That that was a, that had me on the edge of my seat. Oh, you know, I love that. I love that movie, and I thought he did really good in it. And he would make a decent Wolfman. Uh, yeah. But the movie's more than the actor who's, you know, who's portraying the title part. And if they're going to, again, if they're going to make it in 2020, I don't see myself really... Uh, Jumping on board with that. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. For me, I, I, I agree. I think that uh, I wanted to hear more about what it was about. I don't think that you can just attach an actor to something like that and not give details about how they're going to do with that. It uh, it reminded me of my first reaction years and years and years ago when they did an uh, interview with the vampire. And then you heard Tom Cruise was going to play Lestat. Yeah. And you know, you're like, how does that work? 
Um, yeah. Even though Especially the when Rudger Hauer was her choice. Exactly. <laughs> the Hauer, Tom Cruise. So they're pretty <laughs> close, but sort of off a little bit. Um, yeah. So that was that was, and I would hope that they would have learned from that, but they never do. Um, so we'll have to see what they come up with. But I, uh, I have a lot more faith in in your ability and in, in our authors' group ability to to come up with something that, that would be better. Maybe that's what we need to do. All right. Come up with some stuff and, and send it to Universal so that we can save the monsters. Um, but that's going to have to wait until uh, another another day and another interview. Um, I think I think we're running out of time here a little bit. Um, okay. Been going for an hour strong. So, uh, any last any last comments or anything that you wanted to to say before we we close this one out? I want to say anybody who's out there who's thinking about uh, you might want to you know submit something for the anthology Legends of the Werewolf Hunter. Uh, please don't be intimidated by uh, anything that's been said here tonight or uh, think that uh, maybe you don't have the ability to do it, you know, send in what you've got, send in your ideas to, to, to Miles or to myself, and you can contact me at brian at werewolfhunter.com and, uh, you know, tell us, what, tell us what you have planned, what you have. And if you, you know, if, if for this is the first time you're hearing about it, you've got plenty of time to, uh, to download the books. They're available on uh, Nook and Kindle. If you if you want hard copies, you can get those too. Amazon be glad to send them to you, uh, and you can uh, you know read up on it and you know submit something. But uh, we look forward to hearing from you. We're, we got like I said, we have uh, like Miles said, we have three three spots to fill for the anthology, and uh, we hope you're one of them. Very good, absolutely, we do. We are looking forward to hearing from people. Um, so. I'm going to, I'm going to close this out by bringing uh, people's attention to your uh, YouTube channel, Whiskey with a Werewolf Hunter. So if you haven't watched that one before, you've got to go back and see uh, all the episodes. And there are, what's the total number of episodes now? You're, you're, well, I don't really know. We started, I started doing that back uh, beginning of 2019, mm -hmm. I think. And uh, I was doing one every once a one a week for several months. Right, you've got a a, a good collection now. So yeah. we'll talk about in depth information about the books, uh, guest authors, guest uh, commentators on different aspects of the novels. Just amazing stuff. That's great. Um, and of course, the books that are as you said available on uh, on Amazon. And uh, that's 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 where they find the information. So uh, we'll close it out, and I want to want to thank you for again for being here tonight, and uh, we we look forward to putting this book together. It's going to be great. all right. Thanks, Miles. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.